In my youth, I was an okay student. I was in the advanced math and science classes, but in that bright cohort of students, I was at the bottom of the pile. They just grasped concepts so much quicker than I did, and I was always playing catch up, days, weeks behind them. In college, I developed a strategy that actually allowed me to be successful. At the time, I couldn't have told you what I was doing, but now I understand that I was taking any new idea presented to me and breaking it down into its simplest components and then slowly rebuilding it back into a way that made sense to me. So it's probably surprising that I ended up a scientist. But along the way, I fell in love with cells. I even imagine sometimes that I am a cell. They're amazing, and I knew that I wanted to spend my career studying cells. So when I finally finished my training, I got my first faculty position at the University of Kansas. I started writing grants to support my research, and I got some of those grants, but more times I was rejected. And frequently, the comment from the reviewer would be, she has oversimplified the problem. The question she is posing is so simple that it will not advance the science dramatically. I internalized all of that, and I built a narrative for myself that I wasn't as smart as other people. I have a simple brain. And so I compensated by writing more complex grants, designing more complex um, experiments, and we did fine in the lab. Two things in my laboratory completely changed my idea about simple and actually changed the trajectory of my career. The first one happened with a grant we received to study islet transplants. Here I need to step aside and explain to you what is an islet transplant. Islets are the insulin-producing cells. They're microscopic little clusters of cells here in your pancreas. They're the only cells in the body that produce insulin. When you eat a meal, that energy from the food needs to be used by every cell in your body, but it can't get in without insulin. When your islets stop making insulin, you have diabetes. Now, just as we can donate our organs and use those organs to transplant the kidney, heart, you can also take out those microscopic clusters of cells and transplant them for a cure for diabetes. And it works pretty well. 80% of the time, the person who receives the islet transplant will no longer require insulin injections. But there are some big challenges. First of all, it takes an immense amount of tissue from the donors to transplant into one person. Sometimes two or three people have to die and donate their organs for one person to no longer require insulin. And unfortunately, that transplant doesn't survive very long, even with immunosuppressor drugs. So eventually, that person's going to have to start taking insulin in injections. And it were those challenges that we were working on in the lab. One day, my lab manager, Jeanette Williams, came to me, and she said, Lisa, it just seems like the large islets and the small islets are behaving differently. And she gave me a list of all the different ways she, they seem to be working. And I said, Oh, Jeanette, that's such a simple observation. If that were true, somebody would have seen it a long time ago. Go back into the literature, you'll see it's already been, been done. And so she did. She went back through literature back into the 50s and 1960s. She couldn't find anything that described her observation. And so we designed some simple experiments. And sure enough, the small islets were producing more insulin the small islets survived longer. When we transplanted into diabetic rats only small islets, they were cured of their diabetes. If we transplanted only large islets, they were never cured. Now, this is important because in human islet transplant sites, they were mainly transplanting the large islets and kind of forgetting about those small ones. When I was on stage at a national diabetes meeting talking about these results, I was met with the same skepticism that I had shown Jeanette. Oh, if it was that important, we would have already found it. <laughs> but we went on and finished that study, and we published it. A few months later, I got an email from a researcher in Switzerland, Dr. Roger Lehman. And the email said, 
thank you for publishing your work on the small islets. We had the same question. Your work motivated us to go back and reanalyze our data, and we're finding the same results. Within a few months after he published his paper, it soon became widely accepted that the small islets were better. They produced more insulin and they were better for the transplant. Jeanette's simple observation changed the way islet transplants were done. And that was my first example. Simple can be impactful. We then focused our attention in the lab on the large islets. You can't just throw that tissue away. It's healthy cells. How can we re-engineer the large islets to make them function like the small ones? For five years, we worked on that project, and we designed the most complex approaches you can imagine. We, um, we took the large islets and took them down into single cells and attached them to polymer patches so that we could transplant the patches. We poked holes in the islets with enzymes. We even got a femtosecond cutting laser, and we chopped large islets into little pieces. Each one of those was scientifically successful. We wrote manuscripts, we got grants, but none of them were efficient enough to change patient outcomes. I then had a graduate student in the lab, Karthik Ramachandran, come to me one day with a crumpled piece of paper and a, a little picture he'd drawn. We later called that the micromold. It was a simple piece of glass with microscopic divots in the bottom. And the idea was simply take the large islets down to their single cells, load them in the micromold, the cells will fall into the divots and find each other and make new small islets. And I said, oh, Karthik, that's such a simple design. Somebody's already doing that. Go look at the patents that are published. Go look at the manuscripts. It's already been done. So he looked, and there were some things close, but nothing right like his suggestion. And so that became his dissertation. Sure enough, he could make new small islets, and they were so small they could sense their environment and respond quickly with, with insulin. We had to have a new name for the new islets. We called them the Kansas Islet, or Kanslet for short. When we transplant diabetic rats with canslets, they're cured of their diabetes. So the canslet and the micromold worked when everything else we had tried failed. And they worked because they were simple. And that was my second example. Simple can be successful. I go back to those reviewers of my grants. Her hypothesis, she has oversimplified the problem. If the hypothesis were correct, and the answer is simple, how can that be a criticism? In my simple brain, something can't be too simple. In fact, I really dislike the word oversimplified. Because in today's culture, when we say oversimplified, we don't mean too simple. We mean wrong. If it's oversimplified, it's wrong. I'd like to get that word out of our dictionary. I'd like to add a new word to the dictionary, overcomplexified because I have felt the effects of overcomplexified. And in fact, overcomplexified is a word in the Urban Dictionary. And their definition is the act of adding so many extraneous and non-relevant issues to a problem that while it may have had a solution initially, it is now an insurmountable pile of shit. <laughs> I love that definition. <laughs> I have watched overcomplexified hurt so many careers and scientific discoveries. Brilliant scientists who talk themselves out of important experiments because they have to control for this, and what if this happened, and pretty soon they've layered so much onto it that the experiment is impossible. And it's not just science that pushes towards overcomplexity. In healthcare, we do the same thing. A few years ago, my husband was going through chemotherapy for lymphoma, and we were informed that he would have a full-body CT scan done every four to five weeks to monitor the effect of the chemotherapy on the cancer. 
my husband's lymphoma presented itself with large nodules that stuck out of his neck. You could see the cancer. You didn't need a CT scan to tell you if those nodules were shrinking. We often ignore the physical exam for more complicated, more expensive, and sometimes risky diagnostic tests that, while giving the physician more information, don't change the patient's outcomes. Now, I told you that these simple discoveries changed the trajectory of my career. I want to explain that a little bit. Karthik and I were at a national islet meeting, and yes, there are meetings you go to to talk about islets. We were talking about the cancelet and the micromole. Scientists from a large pharmaceutical company approached us and asked if they could use the cancelet to screen for new diabetes drugs. And we said, sure. I ran back to the university and wrote up a proposal. I sent it to the research administrators, and I very quickly got a phone call back. Lisa, this looks like a business. This doesn't look like academic research anymore. And so, after months of planning, worrying, sleepless nights, we licensed our patents from the university and started a business, Licarda. In 2012, the year we launched, we were chosen as one of the 50 most promising startups in the world. In 17 months, we were profitable, and today our annual revenues are in the multi-millions. We screen drugs for other companies using 3D cell clusters and the micromold. The micromold is so simple in its design that it's relatively inexpensive to make, and we can load any cell in there. Cancer cells make mini tumors, and we can test for new chemotherapies. Liver cells, along with the islets, heart cells, anything. And that's what we do for our clients. We do have competitors. There are companies out there that make plates about this size, and they can make about 380 clusters in a plate that size. A micromold that size makes 200,000 clusters. And so I spend a lot of my day talking to clients, describing to them what research needs to be done and interpreting the results for them. And I often get the same response. I know that was really complicated, but you explained it in a way that made sense to me. My simple brain is an advantage. <laughs> in fact, that thing that I thought was holding me back was my detriment that made me less than is probably what made me successful in academia and now in business. The famous philosopher and mathematician, Alfred Norton Whitehead, said that the aim of science is to seek the simplest answer of complex questions. The guiding motto of the life of any natural philosopher should be to seek simplicity, but to distrust it. I'm wrapping my brain around this new view of myself, and I still have that voice in my head that says, simple isn't good enough. It's not as good. And sometimes that voice comes out at the craziest times. In preparing for this talk, I uh, was asked to have a professional photo shoot taken. And the photographer asked what I was going to talk about. And I said, the simple answer is that nature gives us. And she said, oh, Oxum's razor. The simple answer is the best. And the voice in my head went crazy. Oh my gosh, everybody already knows what I'm going to talk about because it's so <laughs> simple. <laughs> Twice I sat down to write a different talk. And twice I had to quiet that voice down and say, this is this, my story, and this is what I'm going to talk about. So maybe that voice is really just the distrust of simplicity that White had talked about. Maybe it's my scientific skepticism. I approached this talk today as an experiment. You are all part of my experiment. My hypothesis is that I'm the only person in the world with a voice 
that says simple is bad. I'll know if my hypothesis is true if my video gets two views. That'll be my parents, <laughs> and that's okay because they'll think I'm wonderful, so, <laughs> and I'll move on. But if there are more people out there who are holding themselves back because in this over-complexified world, their simple brain just doesn't fit, then maybe I can be of benefit. We'll know we've made a real impact if overcomplexified moves from the Urban Dictionary and into Webster's with a modified definition. <laughs> and if there's someone out there like that, I'd like to leave you with this strategy. The next time you're in a group and you put out an idea and somebody says, oh, that'll never work, it's too simple, I want you to stop and tell them the story of the Canslet. Thank you.